I said to my kids on this vacation, if you had to put one word on a billboard for everyone to see that you want to transmit to society, what would it be? Like one word only. It's a great exercise. I play with them sometimes. And your team asked me what my value is. And I said the same word that I would put on the billboard, which is empathy, which is another way of saying seeing people where they are. In order to see people where they are, you have to be very secure in who you are. And most people focus on like what your game plan is all the time. But what really matters is how it lands to the other person. And uh, to do that without losing sight of yourself is I think is really, really important. That's a very big value uh, for me. So I think, you know, love of self and empathy for others and that balance and getting it right is a blessing and a burden, a challenge and a gift. And I think that's where the whole company is, is built off that. How does empathy show up in your kind of everyday activity? Listening. 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 You are a good listener. I appreciate it. Well, here I feel like I'm doing most of the talking. I like it better that way. <laughs> the goal of this podcast is to explore the values and purpose driving organizations, the impact technology can have on humanity, and the humanity behind digitization. I'm Michael Eisenberg, husband, father, and grandfather, author, and venture capitalist at Olive. Olive is an early stage venture capital fund focused on partnering with great Israeli entrepreneurs to build large, meaningful companies and impactful global brands. Join me on this journey. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome Aryeh Borkov as our first ever guest on Aleph's Invested podcast. Aryeh is a great friend and the founder, chairman, and CEO of Lion Tree, an independent investment and merchant bank, advising and investing in transformational CEOs and the companies they lead. Arya founded Lion Tree in 2012 during a time of unprecedented disruption across media and technology. He's known for his work advising on some of the largest transactions in the space, including the recent spinoff of Warner Media from AT&T to create Warner Brothers Discovery and the sale of MGM to Amazon. Lion Tree is deeply immersed in sectors shaping the world around us from gaming and sports to AI, software, and Web3. And while they're based in New York, they have a growing presence here in Israel and the region. Importantly, values sit at the core of what Lion Tree does. And it's been a pleasure getting to know Aryeh over the last 25 years and Lion Tree over the last decade and their unique perspective on where the future is headed and how businesses can build and capture value in an evolving market. Arya is a graduate of the University of California at San Diego. He resides in New York City with his family. Arya, we're so happy to have you on the show with us. Let's get started. It's a true honor to meet a man who personifies values that create value. Have you done one of these before? This is the, you're the first, I told no, you. No, but, but have you ever done a podcast? I've never been the interviewer. I've been the interviewee many uh. times. Have you done one? <laughs> yes, I've done over a hundred. I know. <laughs> Okay, Ari, this is so fun. Well, I haven't really been a subject of too many. Um, and it's my first one with a close friend and the first one in Israel. There you go. There's a first for everything. Yeah. All right. So welcome, Ari. Thanks for joining us here at Aleph in Tel Aviv. I actually want to start on something uh, deeply personal. For those who don't know, Lion Tree uh, is an amalgam of two names, Lion and Tree. Lion, of course, is the English of Aryeh, your first name, which is a Hebrew word, and, and tree comes from your wife's name, Ilana. I think in the, our world, it's pretty bold to name a firm uh, after you and your wife, even in symbolic terms or, or hidden meaning, so to speak. Why did you choose to name the firm Lion Tree? Well, why is that bold? Why is it bold? I think it's bold because uh, there's something family about it, maybe even less business about it. Well, um, I guess I would say it was important to me to have a company name that for most people that are not as insightful as you and <laughs> your listeners uh, would not be identified with me or my wife, uh, but would belong to everybody else, employees, partners, and uh, entrepreneurs and whoever we do business with, business with today and well into the future, that they would be able to call the firm their own. That was the most important thing for me. And so that's why I did not want to have a name 
publicly associated with myself for everyone to to be able to understand, uh, you know, out in the open. At the same time, I knew it would take blood, sweat, tears, sleepless nights to build it, and I wanted to have it be deeply personal to me and my family uh, in a very inner being uh, way that the, that the journey has to be to make it worthwhile, and it would take everything out of me. And them, I guess, right? And shared them, sacrifice. And yeah. them, shared sacrifice. And not just, and, and the kids too, right? And, um, and, and it's only fair that, uh, that they would be identified with it. And it's almost better that they're identified with it in a sort of private way. Yeah. So you have this, like everything in life, a dual meaning. Um, so for everyone else, Lion Tree is theirs. And it has many definitions. It has the strength of the lion and the uh, forward ferociousness of moving something forward that has to be entrepreneurial and the fragility of nature and then the tenderness of what you have to build. Um, and I'd say the deep roots of the tree. The deep roots of the tree you have to go in to go up, and um, which is a real theme for us and for everybody in my view right now. Um, but for me personally, it's always about um, the attachment to, to me and the family and what it takes and the sacrifice. One of the reasons I asked the question is, you know, I've been to your conference, Media Slopes, which, as you know, I don't miss. It's my favorite conference of the year. No offense meant to anybody else. Um, but I've said this to you before. It actually almost feels like your bar mitzvah sometimes when I'm there because it really feels like family is invited. Um, and it's all these high-powered CEOs and executives from around industry and around the world. But everyone feels like one kind of lion tree family. How do you explain that? Like, Am I the only one who feels that way, by the way? <laughs> no, I feel I feel it's a community. Um, it's, even, it's even hard to call you and everyone else clients, uh, you know, which is the nomenclature of a bank. Um, uh, and Or even entrepreneurs, I mean, because obviously you are an entrepreneur, you are a client, and so, is, so are the other people that are in attendance. But it's really a community, and uh, it's the reason why Lion Tree exists, and has, we have no reason to exist. No one said out of the blue and called me saying, by the way, I, I really think that uh, you know, the world needs another bank, or the world needs Lion Tree, or the world needs you to create something. No one called me and said that, although a few people did encourage me, and everyone knows who they are. Um, um, but the group of people that come together really make up the company. It's the inside and the outside. It's an inside outside journey and you never lose sight of the pillars of it. Um, and so it's not solely the people inside, even though they're very important. It's really also the people outside that feel they're invested in the journey and with each other. Uh, that's the most important thing that the community of people is not just through me. It's really with each other. And the minute that you create a forum for them to do business with each other, then you break down borders in a very comfortable way. And it's a different sort of platform of uh, leadership, in my view, that's very important for this moment that has an elasticity to it beyond just the product of mergers, acquisitions, raising capital, taking companies public, but also could be a platform for purpose, other things that we don't foresee yet, filling the gaps in our society, where there are needs, um, emphasizing certain geographies that are important that you see trend lines. And to do that and to be a good advisor off this platform for this community, you have to be learning with them and for them ahead of time in some cases, uh, which is a responsibility. And frankly, the prerequisite for being a good advisor is that your, your advice gets very stale if you're not learning. So w one of the things, you know, or maybe the core ethos of this podcast and what we're talking about is is how values create value. One of the core values I think you and I share, we think about a lot is trust. Um, you talk about the conference or Lion Tree as a community. I, I mentioned the word family. Certainly for communities to thrive, there needs to be trust. And for families to stay together, there needs to be trust. I'm always struck uh, by how there's Chatham House rules basically uh, at the Lion Tree Conference, but they're never... You never stand up and say, hey, this is Chatham House Rules. You can't leak anything. But nothing leaks from there. There's like implicit trust in the room. Where does that come from? And do you think that's actually important for creating economic value for you and for others out of it? You know, it's, it's interesting because people sometimes, 
I'm sure you've had this experience and so do your listeners where someone tells you something in a conversation and it's a very uh, close relationship or a close friendship, but they feel the need to say, by the way, this is between me and you. And I always say to them, well, you, you, you're the one choosing to tell me. Like, <laughs> I, I didn't ask you to tell me anything, but like, but then you could say, of course it's between me and you. You can trust that. But if you have to say that, you know, you're obviously, they're obviously either saying it because they feel like they have to or they're, they don't really fully trust it or something like that. But I'm always saying like, by the way, like, we don't have to have a conversation. You feel the need to get off your chest, you know, then you're taking the risk that this is a trusted conversation. So there's a certain amount of integrity. There's, there's a term called tensegrity. Tension, integrity, tensegrity. Interesting. It's a structure, if you look it up, that has no pillars that holds up this structure. It's almost like when your kids went to a schoolyard and had the structure that you can climb up that had the tension of the structure hold it together. It had perfect integrity of the structure. That's the room. So everyone has the right amount of integrity and tension holding it together where there is no need for any artificial pillars that you have to sort of like use as a crutch because there's perfect tension and integrity in the room. And when you create that, you don't have to say, by the way, this is between me and you or no posting to social media accounts. Because if I say that to everybody, then it's like almost like implied that I'm worried about it or that the room is not created properly. And it's supposed to be created properly because of everyone's... In, in, Everyone is the right. Everyone's in the right community and doing the right thing. So therefore, I don't have to say those things. So quite obviously, one of your core values is is trust, um, and having people around you that you trust and that trust you and trust each other. What else would you say are your kind of core personal values? Because Lion Tree is created in your image. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you're the founder. You're the CEO. You're the leader. Uh, you have a great team. I know many of them. Um, but what are your core values on, on, on a personal level uh, before we get to the business? Um, I was, I, I said, I said to, I think my kids on this vacation, if you had to put one word on a billboard for everyone to see that you want to transmit to society, what would it be? And uh, like one word only. And it was, it's a great exercise. I, I play with them some, sometimes. And, uh, and, and your team asked me while you were, uh, freshening up in preparation <laughs> or doing makeup or something for the podcast, uh, what my value is. Some of us are not good looking. Thank you. What am I going to do? You know, <laughs> well, my, we need help. <laughs> well, my, my values are, and my core values, and I said the same word that I would put on the billboard, which is empathy, which is another way of saying seeing people where they are. And, um, by the way, you know, we have a in company that we're invested in called empathy.com. I know it's Ron is a great CEO, a great founder. I love, I, you've introduced me to him and it's a, I think it's a great company. Um, and, um, but empathy is a great concept because it, um, to, in order to see people where they are, you have to be very secure in who you are. Um, and, um, and most people focus on like what your, what your, what your game plan is all the time. But what really matters is how it lands to the other person. And uh, to do that without losing sight of yourself is I think is really, really important. That's a very big value uh, for me. Um, but you have to do it in a sense that you can also make sure you're taking care of yourself. And that balance is really, really critical. Um, so I think, you know, love of self and empathy for others and that balance and getting it right is a uh, is a is a blessing and a burden, a challenge and a gift, and uh, and I think that's where the whole company is, is built off that. that what concept. are some of the words that your kids put on the billboard? <laughs> um, I think they put uh, um, like uh, like you know, charity. They put words like uh, um, confidence. They put words like um, uh, practice. Thing, you know, depending on their age, you know. <laughs> Um, but, but dad, don't tell me to study for a test. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. It's more, more words. Yeah. Exactly. So speaking of like community, um, you were involved with the board apes yacht club and some of the music videos around that. And these digital communities are, are starting to proliferate. Why do you want to be involved with something like the board apes, uh, yacht club? Uh, what do you see the future of that kind of community as and, and, and then what do you think are both the opportunities and the pitfalls uh, in these kind of digital communities? Yeah, well, I mean, I think 
one is I, I believe in insurgency. Um, so, and curiosity, which could be another word, by the way, for a billboard. Um, I think that um, we, I spent a lot of time with the established companies, most of my time. Um, I, I frankly could spend all my time with them at this point in my career. And uh, that's most of my community. But I don't want to be um, stubborn or, um, or, uh, or have tunnel vision around just the establishment. I want to really understand what's around the corner, which speaks to knowing people like you and understanding new companies. You're calling me an insurgent? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're, 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 always with, you're always with the curious and the new. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but hopefully getting to the new establishments as well, you know? And, uh, and, uh, but, so I would like to know what's around the corner and, and, and what could take off. Within that, you're going to pick up some findings that make it all the way and some things that are just kind of flashes in the pan. Um, and I guess that's your whole world in, in venture at the end of the day. But for me, it's also how those can relate to the large companies and what they may be interested in and how they connect the dots, not just from an investing perspective, but a business development perspective and a R and D perspective. Um, and then reforming new media companies, which is in a constant state of innovation and transformation. It's probably one of the most innovative sectors all the time. It's transforming itself, music, media, other forms of entertainment. Uh, one of, one of America's best exports, I would say. Um, so the board apes to me represents sort of animation. Um, think about Pixar and Disney and, you know, we all grew up with like the Bambies of the world, but you know, new ones like that. Need You're to younger be than that. Come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but also the way to have digital identity, you know, how do you create a new identity for yourself? That's not the physical or an avatar. Uh, and then how do you use that identity to then form a new music label, a new movie studio, a new, a new community of IP that's not encumbered by the old IP. So if you bring a Justin Bieber together and Justin Bieber puts a song out, it's going to the music label. But if you put Justin Bieber on his ape with a new song, that ape has an unencumbered level of an IP. Is that okay? I mean, like, it's still Justin Bieber. Well, it depends. If you, that's up for grabs, right? So, like, can you create a, a new level of communities and labels and music and media companies and art companies and fashion companies and commerce enterprises with a with a simulation than just the kind of age old infrastructures that we're living in today. It's sort of a restart. I mean, but, but I think about this. Like, there's there's real Justin Bieber and fake Justin Bieber. There's like, are, is that the same person? Is it some sort of digital twin, or is it like a different person? Of course, you can't go see the Justin Bieber gorilla in concert necessarily right now. You wouldn't pay the same amount for that, right? I wouldn't pay to see. I mean, no, no <laughs> either way. Right, exactly. like the <laughs> well, your Bieber. kids, your kids, uh, your kids. You may not want to be screaming and looking at Justin Bieber <laughs> for pictures for if it's a gorilla, you know. <laughs> uh, no, but I think there's a chance to create these new communities and uh, and new media models and gaming and 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 uh, sort of like immersive experiences that go to the four billion gamers of the world. And um, but how immersive is it? Like you know, even if Justin Bieber's on stage or Madonna's on stage. Now I'm dating myself, or somebody younger's on stage. I'm still in a in a concert environment with a lot of other people. There's intimacy there. There's real community. In this kind of digital form of bored apes, there's not real intimacy or community. Like why would no. I be there? No. Well, look, I think you need both. I mean, there's 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 Coachella and uh, things like the Middle Beast in uh, in Saudi, where you go and you watch concerts, and it's fantastic. And you go to a basketball game and and there's immersed, there's physical experiences which are irre irreplaceable, but then you always are doing social, virtual experiences, whether it's on, you know, TikTok or you're doing things uh, that are more, uh, you know, you know, virtual in nature. Even Dungeons and Dragons, when we grew up, and other games you want to play that are uh, that are more fantasy. You know, I think you, I think people look at both, and I think I think the uh, apes and I think these metaverse areas are just another form of escape. But I think it doesn't replace the physical. I think you need both. When we think about all the digital places people to have escaped today, do you think we lose some of our humanity in these digital places? Yes, uh, for sure. Um, I am a face-to-face -face person. I know. Like I, um, I mean, frankly, I did more traveling during COVID than before COVID, um, just because I saw it as a 
competitive advantage. <laughs> um, and that I c trusted myself to create safe spaces more than someone else dictated them for me. Um, and, uh, and I thought there was more like intimate experiences that you could create if no one else was doing it. Um, and uh, so I'm just, it's a differentiation, but I, I like the face-to-face -face better and it just sparks creativity and, and conversations and there's um, environments around you. Um, but I also like, um, you know, virtual experiences that are like, you know, listening to music with your headphones and, um, and having some alone time and stuff like that. I wouldn't get lost in the ready player one, like days on end, you know, kind of, uh, metaverse like, uh, experiences for me or to want my kids to be in games forever or living in alternate universes. Right. But I do really appreciate that gaming can be married with education as a learning tool or simply, for example, like as educational tools to learn how to sing or play piano, uh, to tell some of your own companies. Simply, all of company, exactly, yeah. exactly. But one that I Appreciate like a lot. Plug, thank you. You got it. Sure. So, you know, you learn what's around Download the corner. Download it now. Yeah. yeah. These, these are, these are virtual ways to, to learn, um, and to engage in, in, uh, in education that you may not be able to do physically all the time. Do you worry about it? Like have a global decline in creativity, the more time people spend in kind of the virtual space? Um, no, actually, because I think I think that we've had uh, a, tr a renaissance of creativity over the last uh, few years. Yeah. I mean, look at streaming and uh, content creation. I think we've we've had a glut of creativity, frankly. And I think COVID um, has reduced our creativity uh, in a lot of ways. I, I don't think you you had as much, um, you know, particularly great uh, you know songwriting or. Uh, you know, creations or art going on through the pandemic that you would have thought. Although if you think back to 1919 or what I've heard about the influenza, a year after influenza was over, Carnival started. Interesting. That's when people That's came out. So if we're about on track for that, <laughs> then it's right now is a spark of creativity and humanity that's going to come out of it. I have a full disclosure. I hate Zoom. I really, really hate Zoom. I didn't make investments over Zoom during the, during the pandemic. I'm kind of a face-to-face -face guy. I hate like Zoom too. Are. I mean, Zoom is, has a utility for maybe capital markets and other things that you may not want to be doing in person anyway. Um, and Zoom could be a good replacement for that. But Zoom also has had a captive audience for over three years and not a lot of new product innovation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So think about that for a second. You've been on Zoom and you're, not, you're having the same experience, which is just like a kind of a, a communications tool. Right, you're not. Re it's not really a rich experience. I even find it, by the way, less rich than the telephone, because it feels like people are distracted a lot. It's, it's almost a dehumanizing experience in that it puts this screen between you, whereas the phone goes into your ear, and therefore, like music, it's a more experiential experience. Whereas this visual kind of oddness on the screen, I find terribly distracting and dehumanizing. Yeah. Someone, someone uh, sent me a text the other day saying. Um can we get together in the new year? Um, uh, you know, will you be in Los Angeles anytime soon? Uh, or if not, let's do a Zoom. And I said, uh, I won't be in Los Angeles um, anytime in January. Um, and Zooms are so 2022. <laughs> so come find me in New York or somewhere else I'll be traveling. So, so this person wanted to have a conversation with you. You mentioned capital markets people. Uh, Zoom is good for it because they actually never really want to be in the room in the first place, probably doing all these uh, meetings. Um, your business in particular has been built on relationships. And so as you think about transactions versus relationships, try to delineate for me what makes somebody a master of relationships versus somebody who's really great at transaction or a firm that's really great at relationships versus a firm that's really great at transactions? Great. Uh, great question. I think um, people do what they want to do in life so and with who they want to do it. So I think um, I, I believe that, uh, you know, a relationship first has to be earned um, and a transaction also has to be earned. Um, so one doesn't uh, necessarily lead to the other. Uh, they have to really go together. So if you have a relationship, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be called for a transaction if you don't have experience doing transactions with that person or with that company. Um, so I always say that, like, um, we want to have enough relationships and the creativity 
uh, around coming up with ideas for those relationships as if that that bar is so high that you want to come through for your friends. Not that you feel like it's entitled that they're going to call you and say, hey, we've thought of something and we're calling you because there's a certain amount of um, uh, competition in this business that you want to see that relationship be, um, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, justified by your own sort of performance all the time. And uh, at the same time, you want to be treated fairly, right? So, like, I think, I think um, when you're doing a, a transaction with with a relationship that you have, then uh, you're also going to want to come through for them, and uh, and perform on the execution of that transaction much better than just sort of like calling it in. So, I think everything goes back to quality and care, and the community, and coming through for the the people that you're working with, in a in a way that's uh, that's very that's very uh, that's very high standard. Um, but I don't think that we're going to do every transaction with the people that we that we work with. I think they're going to do the deals with the people that they should be doing deals with, and that we're going to have to work very hard to earn our keep every single day. And that goes back to creativity and coming up with the best ideas. But that's informed by the fact that we should know each other really well. We should know our, their goals and objectives, and that takes a long time to get. So if we know what the objectives of those CEOs are or the investors are, then we should have a head start in knowing what the transaction should look like and should have a better and trusted uh, dynamic in trying to get them done for them. David Zaslav, the CEO of Discovery, I know said about you that you really get people. You get that it's not a transaction. You kind of get the creativity around it. I assume that was in the context of the Warner uh, media deal. I think there's something else which I want to dig into, which is how do you think about the difference between how you build a firm for the long term versus how you build a firm for transactions of the short term and and are they radically different in the way you choose to build a firm yeah so i i always say uh, well first of all i have to say that you know transaction in and of itself transactions in and of themselves are important yeah they pay the bills they pay the, the bills they pay the bills and um you know you have you have to um be commercial um about uh, doing business and you have to also know how to you know get things over the finish line. Everyone in these businesses, you know, are, do have, um, constituents and, uh, and, uh, do have shareholders and stakeholders that they're counting on. In your case, it's your family. You better get it right. Well, yeah, but, or employees or like, you know, the, uh, or the future, the future constituents of the company. But I'm saying the CEOs have shareholders and if they're entrusting us to do transactions with them, then we have to make sure that we come through for them. We don't, we don't want to, we want to be an additive dynamic to that. So I think transactions are important. Um, you just want to have a lot of shots on goal for it. My point is you don't want to make decisions for the here and now at the expense of tomorrow. If you look at any company that you invest in and you determine the valuation of the company and you look at the discounted cash flow model of that company, 80 to 90% of the valuation is in the terminal year, which is determined by the perpetuity growth rate, discounted back. 100%. Right. So that means you have to figure out what that business looks like in the nth year at the end of the day. So if you're making decisions based on what that business looks like at the end of the day, discounted back, that has the highest amount of opportunity in that nth year. That's how I think about LionTree. What's the best opportunity I have for the company at the end of the day? And if I defer towards that moment, if I'm afforded the opportunity to defer, which goes back to liquidity and paying the bills and having the right people in place, then I'll have a better outcome to play long. It's really hard to do that. Most people can't think that way at the end of the day. I mean, quarterly bonuses, annual bonuses. I mean, most people don't think that way. How do, how do, you, how do you kind of keep yourself on that road to think that way? Well, on one, on one level, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the mindset of an equity holder, right? Just to be, you know, more just financial about it. It's if you're building enterprise value and you're, tr and you're incentivized by, by the growth of the value of the enterprise and you own the equity of the enterprise, that is how you should be thinking about it, right? Because you're incentivized to go long-term to build yep. the equity value, right? If you're incentivized to maximize cash, um, then you may not be thinking that way. Um, but I kind of think that, um, you know, cash um, tomorrow may have more opportunities that you don't see than cash today. What do you mean by that? Meaning that um, it goes back to, uh, to go back to uh, the, uh, the tree of prosperity, 
<laughs> and uh, and your Devar Torahs and everything else. So like Yosef. So if you have seven years of uh, plenty followed by seven years of famine, um, and you were smart enough to know how to save up during those seven years of plenty, and you had a differentiated edge during those seven years of famine, and you knew how to create systems and frameworks to sustain. See, I read the last one, right? By you gosh. <laughs> to sustain. Um, then you may have a competitive edge in markets and periods of time where that cash is more valuable in the future for opportunities that you don't see today. And there's some optionality around that, right? And I like that because when you build businesses at the beginning stages, you have to, you have to sprint very fast to make sure that you have a, a successful startup, maybe even scale up. But what you're really trying to get to is an opportunity to walk briskly and have a very efficient long-term enterprise that, that has sustainable value. That's really where you're trying to get to. One of my takeaways from what you said is you're actually pretty excited about the years of famine we have upon us right now in this down market. Is that, <laughs> is that fair? Sure. I like, the, I like the more challenging moments. Because it brings out creativity? It brings out creativity. It makes people more raw? It makes you understand what your competitive advantages are. It leans on your community. It shows what real value is? It shows what real value is and values are. And values are, right? You, scarcity, is, scarcity is a much bigger and better catalyst for decision-making than I think abundance. I totally agree with that. Why do you think so? Because you have to make choices. You have to prioritize. There's a rabbi who I always admired. His name was Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich. He said, hard decisions are not between good and bad options and good and good options. They're between the lesser of bad options. And scarcity brings that out. I have to make the choices of lesser of bad options and it forces creativity so if I can invent maybe a third option. That's right. The hard, the hard thing is the shift. The hard thing is when the scarcity starts to move to abundance or the abundance moves to scarcity. It's the delta. I think it's like, it's like, um, it's like when people uh, started uh, the pandemic and uh, it's as if they said to me or said to you, uh, by the way, uh, Michael, uh, is, your, um, is your email not working? And uh, you said, no, 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 no. Um, my email is not working either. Like the whole, the whole broadband system is down. No one's email is working. And all of a sudden you said, oh, that's great. I could relax for a while. <laughs> I can go home, spend time with the family, not check my email. That's great. And then about a year later, you come to me and said, your email is like, still not working, right? I'm like, no, no, no. Mine's been working for weeks now. <laughs> you go, oh, no. <laughs> that delta, that shift that you missed is the scary part. Did you find that, by the way, during this is a side point, but like during the pandemic, you found out kind of what people's true character was on some level because of the scarcity, because of the distance. And even now in this down market, I feel like truly resilient people are standing up. People who are true to their values are standing up versus, you know, maybe what Akerloff might call the, the animal spirits that are coming out. Yeah, I mean, I like, I mean, it goes back to humility, right? Like I think um, humility creates power, um, not the other way around. Um, and um, I think that, um, I think if, if a scarce period of time or a challenging period of time helps, uh, you know, highlight that humility or helps the sheen come off, then you see people's character. But I think it's just helpful to get to what ultimately I think is a great business uh, value, which is self-awareness. So how do you do that? So, so you're doing billion dollar transactions or multi-billion dollar transactions. You're in the CEO's office and boardrooms of fortune 100 companies. Um, you're running around the world talking to capital providers, which we'll come to in a second. Like, how do you stay self-aware and humble in, in that environment? Well, because you're wrong most of the time, right? I mean, um, what you get from being in the public markets, uh, which I used to do covering stocks, and I think most people have P&Ls every single day. Um, and uh, that keeps a certain amount of truth and self-awareness front and center, right? I agree. Um, and, uh, but if you, but you don't, you shouldn't need a P and L to be self-aware, right? Um, I get it actually in the middle of the night. Like <laughs> I, 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 uh, I'm always thinking, I'm always in my head and I always sort of emerge at three in the morning to like a level of subconscious and spend an hour. I'm not really awake. I'm not really sleeping. But if you, I actually track now in the Fitbit and everything, my sleep patterns and it's true. Three to four in the morning, I'm self-correcting. Oh yeah. And, uh. I'm I'm just not sleeping well, but no, I'm sleeping very well until three in the morning. Then I get up for an hour and self correct but I'm not really up. And then I go back to sleep for an hour, and then I get then I then I'm then I'm a different person in the morning. 
And there's, it's about self-correction, self-growth, working things through, being truthful with yourself, and then, uh, and then getting... But you have, to, you have to be self-aware to do that. Um, it's about the tree, going in to go up. Um, and it's, but it, but if, that's fine if you live and operate a business alone. But when you're operating a business with others, you kind of are counting on everyone else to do the same thing. And if people have a, well, ego is basically, you know, a sort of inflation above self-awareness and insecurity is sort of a discount mm -hmm. below self-awareness. I consider ego and insecurity sort of like mirroring sides of each other with self-awareness being the par value. That's an interesting line. Okay. That's how I think about it. Where's self-confidence in that, by the way? Um, I think there's nothing wrong with self-confidence as long as it's balanced with humility. Yeah. Um, you need a certain amount of self-confidence to to get out of bed and, and do your job every single day. Um, but it has to be backed up by results, right? Yeah. So you're spending, speaking of long-term and long-term thinkers and long-term relationships, you've been spending a lot of time over the last bunch of years in this region uh, broadly. I assume developing relationships. When you look at this world going forward, uh, there's obviously been the Abraham Accords, which have connected... Uh, the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, Israel, Sudan, and maybe who knows, maybe Saudi Arabia in, in the near future. When you think about the future of the world and your merchant banking business uh, a decade from now, how does this region play into it in a way it hasn't in the past or, or does it for that matter? Um, I, lo I love, I love this topic because, um, you know, you go through life and you wonder if how many things really actually change in the world. Um, and we, and I think everyone that lives in Israel and everyone that studies Israel and is pro-Israel is a student of history and is, is very focused on, um, you know, geopolitics to some extent, right? And so you're aware of what happens around you. Um, and uh, and some things are always fluid to, to, to some extent here. Um, but very rarely does you see like a, a cementing of a structural shift as much as you've had in the last few years, um, which is not just about alliances that you've talked about, but also a de-emphasis of ideology and sort of an emphasis of business as a currency, uh, which also goes to generational changes that the newer generation, maybe younger than us, have just decided, you know, just to get on with it. And, um, and travel and focus on the gaming and the metaverse and the business transactions and the tourism and, um, and, uh, and doing things, um, uh, in the right way maybe, and investing and, and, uh, and obviously that can go to an extreme as well, by the way, cause it can't just all be on business culture matters a lot and history matters a lot and where we're going matters a lot. But I think it's really encouraging that sort of the Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf states and beyond the ones you mentioned, I mean, you could put Oman and Bahrain and, and others in there too. Uh, and Israel have so much commonality culturally. Um, and, and in some ways they're younger than Israel uh, in the way they've been built and, um, and opportunities to do business together in capital, in capital markets, in an appreciation of the uniqueness of Israel's technology uh, industry and making something out of nothing vis-a-vis -vis like, you know, water and scarcity and cyber and all the best industries that we have here in Israel. Yeah, scarcity turns out to be a great natural resource for Israel. Correct. Yeah. But, th but those countries have cared about things that Israel hasn't cared about, like architecture in some ways and, you know, and um, traffic. <laughs> the, the, the grid, if you drive through, you know, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, like there's no traffic, you know, they figure that out, you know, so... Yeah, we we haven't. <laughs> Maybe that's democracy. No, see, these roads were built for horses and carriages, and then they try to put cars on them. It doesn't work that well. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think there's some lear learnings there. But I, I I like the fact that there's a lot of opportunity now. I mean, I don't want to be sort of um, uh, you know utopian around it about it because you know in this part of the world things could change on a dime, and and it's uh, it's sort of like you know rough neighborhoods, right? But like, but better to protect yourself around rough neighborhoods with with friends than alone and Israel's been alone for too long. So it's nice to have friends and, and frankly, Egypt and Jordan have been friends for a long time. And hopefully that these friendships now are the beginning of a very long-term relationship. But, but it's your view. I think that, that, that in what you said right now, that the business actually is almost a better carrier of that relationship than politics is. Look, countries operate in their borders 
businesses operate cross border, especially multinationals. Yeah, to, in the last hundred years, that's the case. Correct. Or actually, maybe since the British, British East Asia Tea Company, but but certainly today. So businesses that operate cross border and multinationals then are represented by CEOs and board members that also have to have multi jurisdiction perspectives and investors that come from many different areas and appreciate a multi-jurisdiction and geopolitical perspective that has to obviously subjugate ideology and put first and foremost you know, returns and purpose and what the objectives of the businesses are versus what the borders stand for. And, and those businesses are very complex to manage on an international level. You know, you think about those businesses that come out of the U.S., like the Microsofts of the world, the Apples, the Amazons, the Googles, are the Disneys of the world. Some of those haven't even really effectively gotten into the Gulf or Israel, like, like Disney or like Warner Discovery. But there's a lot more to still grow and to do. Um, and I think that, like, that opens up a lot of new investors and new business partnerships and commercial opportunities that will, I, I think, draw attention to this region that will benefit Israel in process um, that will bring a lot more companies beyond tech, like other industries that um, that not the supermarket umbrellas of tech maybe were just too generic. And now we'll get into the the different parts of um, the uh, the industrial economy, sort of retail, commerce, luxury, media, healthcare, financial technology, defense, security, you know, f energy, water. Yeah, food. Nine and a half million Israelis is not a big market. 250 million people in a region at this point is a big market on yeah. some level. And yeah, but nine and a half million Israelis and 10 million people in, yeah. Emir in, the, in the Emirates, not all Emiratis, obviously. Yeah. Um, but um, a, lot, a lot to do together. How would you react to the following uh, comment? Uh, business and multinational business is fundamentally built on trust. Um, politics on some level is blood sport. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of coalitioning overcomes a uh, lack of trust on some level. And so business becomes a bitter carrier of that trust over time, maybe than politics. Well, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think business has metrics. <laughs> uh, politics doesn't have metrics. But getting elected in places where people get elected at least. Yeah. I think, I, well, Which yeah. maybe the wrong KPI. Yeah. I, I, I think the KP, the business metrics or I'd say milestones are really, really important to verify yeah. those trust. But I think relationships is better in both cases. Interesting. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, the violation of those relationships or the violation of those milestones obviously can be, can be catastrophic. But I mean, at the, at the end, at the end of everything the day, is personal at the end. everything is a, a personal at the end, especially in this part of the world. I think yeah. the relationships are really, really important to foster. And I think those are, that's how things ultimately get done. So if I asked you, okay, you just described to me a vision for the region. What's the business project? or projects you'd like most to come to fruition in this region, what would it be? Without giving away state secrets or business secrets. Um, I would like to have, uh, I would like to see uh, a mutual appreciation of competitive advantages uh, come to play in the region. Is that a business? Yeah, for sure. So that, that's a quilt. Let's just say. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. Israel has some clear competitive advantages, you know, let's just say it's tech, but there are obviously other ones, you know, culturally, tourism and so on. I mean, I'm sure a lot more Israelis are traveling to the Gulf states than the Gulf state, um, you know, constituents are coming to Israel right now. That has to get rebalanced. That yeah. goes to media and narratives and making it really fun to go visit Israel. Well, it also goes to the fact that Israelis have like an itch to travel the second any part of the world opens <laughs> up. It's like, oh, let me out of this. Spilkes. Yeah, spilkes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, no, I think so. I think a balance of tourism would be good. And that I think like in the self-awareness idea, you're so creative. It must be better than the beach in Tel Aviv. The big idea I think is, um, a real cap capital markets hub in the region. So I love that. So like you, you, you don't think if you're a U.S. company of listing in Tel Aviv or Abu Dhabi or Qatar or Saudi right now, but you could, if everyone got together in a regional exchange just like you used to think about listing in the LSE or Luxembourg. Um, so I think it's a very interesting part of the world, time zone wise, as, a, as an alternative to the US or China, to list in this part of the world. Um, the, the new London. The new London, the new Europe. The new Europe. To, to season companies longer here. 
uh, with a with a really interesting um, um, emphasis, which is based on growth and tech and you know long term capital associated with it. This this is a great place to foster new capital markets activity with longer term oriented capital. I think that's an amazing idea. I, by the way, I'd be an investor in it. I would I would love that. That's a that's an amazing uh, idea. Um, related to that, so the media loves to kind of uh, talk about. Uh, how should I call it, the evil villain of the day or the bad leader, Sam Bankman-Fried and, uh, and what's her name, Elizabeth Holmes at, at, at Theranos and take your pick. Uh, you work with a lot of leaders. You've actually called out that we need more trust and empathy and uh, reliability of, of business leadership. Um, who is the most inspirational or trusted leader that you've worked with over your career? Well, you. No, cut it out. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I think that... Flattery like, will get you nowhere no, no. over here. <laughs> um, I try to accumulate um, relationships based on uh, loyalty, curiosity. I have as much room in my set of relationships for the loyal as well as the new and the curious. Like, they're equally important to me. The only way you get ejected is based on lack of integrity uh, uh, or betrayal of the trust, effectively, right? Um but there's, so there are a lot of people that are, you know, hopefully fit into the characteristics of value and values that we're talking about. And the mentorship comes from people like the John Malone to the world um, that I've talked about before, but not holistically. Like I wouldn't consider him to be like, you know, we're not, like, we're not the same. You know, I don't like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like a protege or the greatest hits I try to be of a lot of people that have come before me in different areas, whether it's the media industry or the, junk bond industry or the digital disruptors or investors that I've learned from. And so I get to pick from all of them in sort of like a quilt and get the best of. So what, so what are the core values that do create value then? What's, what's on that quilt as the core values? Forget the people. What are the core values? Um, never lower your bar of excellence. Don't subject yourself to mediocrity. Like I hate the, you know, do the best you can comment. <laughs> you know, I was like, well, then you get up in the morning. So now what, you know? <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, the curiosity point. It's um, it's uh, it's trying to get the best out of others as well. It's putting the maximum care into what you're doing. It's thinking about the long term versus just the short term. Um, it's trying to always ask the next question. You know, I I think I think about like if you watch like a great tennis match, and you're watching like great tennis, and you think you've just seen a championship shot, and then someone like Nadal gets the next one. And you're like, I thought, that, I, thought, I thought it was over. Unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. The best so like, I always ask, like, when, when the conversation seems like it's coming to an end, like, always ask like, the next question. And that's where all the magic sits. You know? And so like, that, that um, inquisitive nature is really, really important, I've learned. Um, and you pick up a lot of learnings there. How, do, how does empathy, the word you used before, show up in your kind of everyday activity? Listening. 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 You are a good listener. I appreciate it. Well, here I feel like I'm doing most of the talking. I like it better that way. <laughs> so, so I know you 25 years or so. Uh, you were once a cable analyst. Now you're running this very successful, I think inspiring, candidly, uh, merchant bank. Um, what motivates you still today to get out of bed every morning? What's in my mind? What's in my head? What does that mean? It's a vision. I mean, it's a vision. It's a vision of what the platform of Lion Tree could be for others and for the people that work at Lion Tree today and into the future. And uh, we're not even halfway optimized to what I see it could be in the future. And that's a geographic comment. That's not just simple expansion, but like really playing into where the world's going and how centralized organizations play with companies and investing in those gaps. Um, but also what the platform can create in terms of cultural um, innovations and, uh, and new businesses together, working with the partners that we have. Um, and it's sort of like the best is yet to come through these different periods. And, uh, and the community sort of demands that we keep playing and, and, uh, and we're all partners together in this. And I, I feel like uh, we're nowhere close to where we could be. Uh, it's exhausting. It's exhausting, but um, 
but you you constantly have new ideas and chessboard moving, and one move begets another. And so I feel like I feel like the vision is still like pulsating, and uh, I, I, you want to keep playing. You use the term "where the world is going." Where do you think the world is going? Well, we talked about it. I mean, I think I think that um, I think that um, the cultural um, areas of sports and gaming and media entertainment are being used as a currency, just like investing was a currency and business is a currency to break down borders and to create new hubs. And some of those hubs are here. Interesting. There you go. Um, so there must be a problem given that you're thinking about where the world is going in the world that you would most like to fix. What is it? Well, I mean, I think, well, you talk about redistribution of wealth a lot in the U.S., or maybe here also. Redistribution of energy, water, food could be really interesting from a, in a scarce moment. Yeah, I think, I, agree I, think with that. I think those are, that's probably the best use of sovereigns, you know, where you're really supplying. Um, Is it redistribution or, or new, new generation? More efficiencies. More efficiencies. Yeah, more yeah. efficiencies and redistribution because I think, you know, you have to get to, countries like Africa or continents like Africa, sorry. And, um, and other areas, I think the other thing that's interesting is population uh, trends. I mean, China's population is on the downward trajectory, which, um, I think the only, the only area where population is really truly growing is Africa and in the middle East and the middle East, um, Israel in particular, but there are other places too. Okay. Okay. So I think it'd be interesting to see like how the world's going to redistribute some of these, essential resources as population demographic shift. Frankly, even changes like voting patterns, like in the US, like post the pandemic, a lot of uh, people have moved around the country. Yep. You know, people used to know which state voted red, blue, purple. Like I think a lot of those things will shift in the next few elections. Yep. Be interesting to see. Pollsters may have to earn their keep finally. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, that, that question of global growth when demography is slowing down and everywhere but the Middle East and Africa, do you think like we're in a period of, of, of declining growth because of that economic growth? Yes. We are. Yes. How does that reshuffle the deck? Um, we're in a period of declining growth with higher costs of capital, both together. Um, and the question is like where the growth, where the next cycle of growth truly comes from. And then how you value enterprises when metrics are in decline. So think about the valuation of that enterprise over the long term and assigning a perpetuity growth, stress growth rate. Right. When more that. people are dying than being born. Correct. And from a business perspective, you know, when the near term metrics are in the negative, how do you know what, positive number to assign to the last year. That's a great comment. If it should be positive. And if it's not positive, then you should then shift your attention to the short term versus the long term and get what you can get today, which is transactional. And so my, so then forget everything I said, right? And then just go get it for the here and now because there is no tomorrow. And then your value system is going to shift completely or it's going to really test who can have a purposeful values oriented life in moments of scarcity? Like when they're scared about the long term. Yeah. I mean, or when, pessimistic about the long term. Which is totally fair at the end of the day. I mean, if you don't have excess discretionary income and you have to worry about paying the bills, is it really fair to ask them to focus on things like ESG and climate change and? All these, all these world problems, is it really fair to ask them for that when they have to put food on the table for their kids and pay the energy bills and water and everything like that? As you know about me, I think that ESG is a bag of nonsense. First of all, because it has terrible metrics, uh, has no metrics really. And it's just like a virtue signal with, with that, where people express their values at somebody else's expense, right? Uh, to your point, people can't pay their their bills, but we should go do something for ESG. So mm -hmm. I, I think that kind of stuff, again, if you want to be a values-based person and a values-based investor that creates values or values-based business that creates values, express your values and grow the pie. Don't do it at someone else's expense. But, but let's get, but let's double click on that for a second. So like 
it's really hard for a public company to squeeze 10% of growth out of an existing enterprise every single year. 100%. It is really hard. For a growth company or a venture company, maybe it seems easier. But if you're a public company and you're established and you need to grow 10% to get a an outperformance level of your stock price, that is not an easy thing to do. And it will be increasingly difficult over the next few years. Agreed. So then how do you, you know, how do you, um, how do you deliver, how do you find that growth? Tell us. Well, it goes to what's, what's structurally um, an area of growth in the economy versus what's cyclical downturn in, in hopes of a future recovery. Does it also have to do with the incentive structures maybe? Maybe yeah, what would you change in the incentive structures to make it work? I don't think it's in the incentive structures right now. I think we're in an economic slowdown with higher cost of capital. And I think we're in a, a redistribution of supply chains, which increases the fundamental cost structures for companies. And then I think you have too many companies that have to reconsolidate to create economies of scale and give themselves a better advantage on the ability to generate profits and growth um, without having as much competition as they have today. So I think a, a reconsolidation of industries will be very, very important. But structural areas of growth right now, security, cyber, um, scarcity driven industries like water and energy, like we talked about, food, those are structural areas of growth. I think commerce is still an area of growth. You know, gaming, sports, consumption patterns like that. But but for major companies, uh, I think you have to give yourself an advantage by growing down, creating cost efficiencies, and um, and really focusing on profitability, sometimes much more than even scale. For our listeners, Arya's annual letter was called Growing Down, which is just a great title <laughs> Thank for you. a letter based on the tree growing its deep roots, but also based on ethics of our fathers, the, the great Jewish text, which uh, offers some great clues into how to do that. Um, just to go back to your point about a shrinking global population, which impacts growth. So you're a father of four. I'm a father of eight. So a lot of people out there not having kids and even if they're having them, it's below the repopulation rate of 2.1. Why, why do you think people aren't having kids today? Um, you have double the amount of kids that I have. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know why people aren't having kids these days. Um, it's a good question. Um, you grew up, I think your parents were academics. Yes. Um, you didn't come from money. You've built this amazing business yourself. Like, we look back and say, how did I do it? How did you do it? Step by step. I mean, I view it as a very methodical career build so far. Um, I mean, started with a decision just to be a specialist versus a generalist, uh, meaning a generalist approach, which is nothing, there's nothing wrong with it, which is like, let's say like a bank training um, or learning how to be a uh, sort of you know, educated in corporate finance, for example. I, uh, I sort of deferred that to later. I want to understand an industry early on and stick with it. And I knew the longevity of that industry knowledge would, would accrue to my benefit over time. And this is again, playing the arc of life and, and that, and that curve. And so it, I was assigned, you know, media communications technology early day one, effectively. And so I knew that learning the people, the content, the fundamentals, the capital structures around those companies, the people, the pattern recognition would, would give me an, an advantage over time and I would keep learning around it. Um, so that specialist dynamic and that confidence that I had over time that I knew that industry would allow me to take risk in other areas. So the more confidence I felt in one place, the more risk I could take in other places. I love that. Which is like learnings effectively. Um, put yourself at risk someplace without starting over per se. And that was products. So I started in high yield bonds, then I went to equities, then I went to banking, but all in the same industry segment. And then that allowed me to, to contribute while I was sort of leaning on people until I rebalanced. I love that. So you're like a media expert, a telecom expert. Uh, I'm on Twitter. You're not, as best I know. No. Instagram is your social media of choice, I think. Yeah, it's my expression. Why? Why Instagram? It's a unique journey for me um, that I get to travel and do business with these uh, 
relationships in these great places that are culturally significant uh, in these industries, whether it's art, fashion, music, um, in these great uh, cities around the world. And, uh, and they're beautiful um, pictorials. So um, I try to express that journey rather than them being uh, lost. And uh, I pinch myself that I'm on this journey. And I don't want them to be, uh, it's my own sort of journal. You, th you think the pictures are make it more human than maybe the text of Twitter? For sure. For sure. And Twitter is also like, um, the problem with Twitter in my mind is um, um, it, um, I, I don't think I've ever had, by the way, on Instagram, a negative comment in the comment section. It's hard to say anything negative about you, Ari. <laughs> but I, but I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not like Twitter. The problem with Twitter is like the comments are as significant as the initial expression. Mm-hmm. So meaning that like if you express something on Twitter, the comments have, they're not like a smaller typeface. Right. It's the exact same relevance as the initial expression. It's very human like that. We're all equal. Well, I don't think you're all equal if you're the one expressing the initial <laughs> conversation, right? So I think then it's like supposed to be a comment based on the initial expression. But I think for the picture, um, to me, it's like this is this is a thing. And if you want to comment on it, great. But then you have to go search for the comments. Uh, what, what makes you human or vulnerable? Oh, I mean, the mirroring of the mirroring effect you have on others, and that they have on me every single day. I mean, uh, you know, my entire life is in relationship to to others, um, and um, you could you affect people in an inspirational way, and a as a leader, but also as a partner and a um, facilitator of people's businesses. And then they affect you in, in the way that uh, you feel a part of that or not. And sometimes you can be very disappointed um, by people all the time. That's very hard to deal with that. Is there something that makes you cry? Nostalgia of family. I don't, I don't get nostalgic about business because I, I, I try to look forward versus backwards. But when you look at the passage of time of kids yeah. and family or grandparents and people have come before you um, that, you know, I was on a plane the other day, actually, you know, when you're a plane is a very peaceful experience um, in the sky. It's actually from Proverbs, like the Eagle in the sky concept is a very peaceful perspective of life, right? Because you're higher up. Everything seems smaller. All the problems down below seem smaller, but when you're in the sky and the lights are lower um, and you look at people, you get to, you get to be very like uh, uh, introspective. Um, and so I saw, I was on the plane and my mother was on the plane and my daughter was on the plane and they're both sleeping and I, I have a hard time sleeping. So I was like, and I saw, I, I looked at each of them and, uh, and it took me like backwards and forwards in my, in my life. And that was, that was a very, uh, I wouldn't say I cried, but there was like, maybe there was a tear. There was a nostalgic moment. No, you know? I hear that. So the two questions I ask at the end of this podcast are, how do you want to be remembered at the end of your life? As original. As original. Yeah. You're on a good path for that. And um, in a hundred years, somebody's going to write the biography of Arya Borkov. What should the title be? I know the title already. Go ahead. The Shy and Lazy, The Life of Arya Borkov. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that's okay. The, that my wasn't ultimate, what I expected. My ultimate objective is to be shy and lazy. Yeah, but that's not the biography of Ari Borkov, is it? Well, no, because that means I will Maybe have your kids will write that, right? No, that's, that means I'll have accomplished everything that I want to have accomplished. And then I'll have no guilt about being lazy and shy and sitting around, opening a beer, watching a football game and say, I've done everything I want to do. I can ignore everything in my head that says I have to do anything else because I've accomplished everything I want to accomplish. That will be the biography. Are you really shy? No. Yeah, I, I have def. I there's a there's a there's a French expression that means better alone than in bad company, and I definitely I can be an introvert. Maybe it's different. Maybe it's different from being shy. Um, the life of an introvert. What? <laughs> Everybody knows the what? <laughs> it's a it's a big misnomer about me. Okay, so now we have a bonus question. Those are the two questions we ask every guest. But for everyone listening, today is Arye's fiftieth birthday, and we're recording this on Ari's 50th birthday. And 
In Ethics of the Th Fathers, Pirkei Avot in Hebrew, which Ari quotes in his annual letter, because he's 50, it says, at age 50, you have now reached the age where you give advice. So, first of all, what's your resolution for the next year? The, the Grand Rabbi of Lubavitch said, make a resolution for the next year. And if you were going to give one piece of advice at age 50, what would it be? To have that eagle in the sky perspective all the time. You know, not to get dragged into minutia. Um, That's a great it's really, really, it's really important. I think from a business perspective, I call that like a holding company perspective. You know, try to like help, try to build businesses out of the gaps. Try to like have a bird's eye view and not to get dragged into the mirror show. Um, there's a great book called The Alchemist. Great book. Yeah. And Which I haven't read yet, but I've heard from you. It's great. Yes. And, uh, and the wisest of the wise, wise men said the secret is to... And this was recommended to me, this book by a good friend. Secret of the, the secret is to walk around the castle and to look at the most beautiful things, metaphor for life, while not dropping the oil on the spoon that you're holding in your hand and do both at the same time. That's the secret to happiness. So to have that perspective, look at the most beautiful things and keep all the details in hand at the same time. What's the piece of advice you want to give? You're 50 now, you can give advice. Yeah, exactly. Everything before now has been a practice round. Um, <laughs> um, the piece of advice I have is uh, really look inward. Like, don't, um, don't ignore the things in your mind um, that, uh, that you must do eventually. Like, now, now is the moment to, uh, to clean house. And build deep roots, right? Build, build deep roots. Build deep roots. Because ultimately, you have to figure out... Um, what your edge is right now. And uh, it's okay if you don't have one, it's totally cool to just like cleanse it right now and then restart again. But if you have it, then just focus the spear on that edge and build from there. And that's where all the security is. But if you don't have it, start again. And that's totally fine. But if you have that edge, start from there and plant the seed again from right there. That's amazing. Thank you for joining me on, as the inaugural guest on our podcast. You can find Lion Tree at liontree.com. And on Instagram, you can find a number of accounts at Arye Borkoff. That's spelled A-R-Y-E-H-B-O-U-R-K-O-F-F -F, to follow Arye's journey around the world. And also at Lion Tree underscore LLC and at Kindred Podcast. Hey, listeners, please give us five stars on whatever podcast platform you listen to us on, whether it's Spotify or Apple or Stitcher, wherever you listen, give us five stars. Happy oh, birthday my goodness. To <laughs> Happy Thank you. To wow. Amazing. Happy birthday, dear Harry. Happy birthday to you. So special to <laughs> celebrate the birthday in Israel with you. There you go. Amazing. You go. Happy Thank birthday. You. Thank you. Thank you.